Welcome, everyone, to the Wanderlust School of Transgressive Placemaking. Uh, we're excited to reimagine and remake the far side of the no trespassing sign with you tonight. I am Ida Benedetto. I'm Nathan Austin. And uh, we're, uh, please hold your applause. <laughs> we're uh, really happy to be here um, in this series hosted by Atlas Obscura. Um, we've uh, enjoyed a fantastic residency at Atlas Obscura. If you don't know them, definitely check them out. Um, we'll be hearing from Dylan Thuris very briefly at the end of the program. This uh, beautiful space is thanks to uh, Acme Studio. Acme is a full service um, photo studio and prop rental outfit. Um, thanks so much for lending us the space and all of the beautiful props. And a special thank you goes to Derby. Derby was one of the uh, core collaborators on the Night Heron Speakeasy, um, and you can see him behind the bar. He also built out this stage for us, so thanks so much, Derby. This uh, week's discussion is broken legs, surveillance cameras, and black mold, safety and security off the grid. It's, uh, it's one thing to get into trouble and keep yourself safe, but it's a totally different picture when you are with a larger group of people and you're taking care of other people and you're doing transgressive stuff. Um, our guests today, Mark Krawchuk and Annetta Black, are experts at managing risk. They're, uh, they were at the top of our list when we were looking for people that we wanted to learn from. Um, Annetta has organized the um, Thunderdome um, for Death Guild at Burning Man for over a decade. She's also mastermind of the Obscure Society for Alice Obscura. You shall be members if you aren't already. Um, uh, she is an expert at getting access to off-limits places, and we're very excited to have her here with us from the Bay Area today. You may know Mark Krawchuk from the Lost Horizon Night Market. Uh, Mark is a man who excels at many things, especially making really great systems for really strange, really strange places. Um, I especially dig his Tactical Brunch. If you're not familiar with Tactical Brunch, you should talk to Mark about it afterwards. Uh, Annetta and <laughs> Mark Archer. Uh, Ned and Mark are each going to give a brief presentation, um, followed by some questions and conversations with Nathan and I, and then we're going to open it up to discussion from the audience. Um, the talk is um, filmed by Mike McSweeney over here, and we also have expert note-taking by uh, Lois Beckett. All of this documentation will be on the Wanderlust website by the end of the week. We'll have links and everything. Everything that people are talking about, uh, we'll have links to all of that online. So if you're not good at remembering things like me, we're going to have it all conveniently for you in one place. So now we'd like to give the stage to Annette. Annette Black. Thank you, Ida and Nathan. Let me make sure this is, there we go. So I'm Annette Black. They give me a really nice introduction. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, that are quite different environments. Um, for Atlas, I, I write and I edit, but more recently I've been heading up the Obscura Society, which is our real world exploration branch. And as part of that, we have been trying to get something that we call unusual access. And that started as archives and private libraries, but it's extended into a lot of urban exploration and outsider art installations. And that's brought us into some places, let's see if I can set that down, um, including, the abandoned buildings on Alcatraz, recently into an amazing abandoned train station, and then into this place which I still refer to as the Enchanted Rebar Forest in, um, in Albany near San Francisco. Um, and then my summer vacation for the last decade or so has brought me to the Nevada desert where I'm part of the crew who staged Thunderdome at Burning Man. It's a 44 foot dome which every night for a week we invite people to come in get strapped in and fight their best friends with padded bats. I think it's fair to say that there's no right way to do any of these things. And I'll definitely say for myself, it's still a learning process. And that's what part, part of what keeps it interesting for me. And although there's a lot of things that go into planning all these fun things, tonight we're focusing just not on the fun parts, but on the unfun part, which is calculating risk. 
So I'm going to talk about these two different environments and look at the ways that each one of them represents risk management and challenges, and then the common factors and solutions. First, the gently, gently controlled chaos of doing something stupid over and over again. Thunderdome is just too complicated and too dumb to describe, so I'm going to take a second and toggle over and show a slightly embarrassing video. And I've been doing this now. This is coming on year 14, shockingly. <laughs> So the uh, official motto of Thunderdome is um, days since last injury zero. We actually have a sign on the outside of Thunderdome that says that. And it started as a joke, but it's absolutely true. But our unofficial motto is what could possibly go wrong? And our unofficial motto number two is it's all fun and games until someone loses a testicle. The thing about doing something inherently risky over time is that it doesn't make you inured to risk. What it does is it finely tunes that risk tolerance. That guy doing that one stupid thing Fine. That lady, she's a problem. People get injured every single day we operate Thunderdome. And that's just during showtime. Drunk people fall off the dome in the middle of the night. Equipment fails because of the environment and because of hard use and because of drunk people cramming things into it. Our showtime runs during Burning Man's prime time, which means thousands of drunk and high people, fireworks, explosions, flame cannons, um, art cars, thumping music, all of this is in a harsh desert environment that has obviously no power, no grid, and is, is prone to sudden blinding dust storms. What we have gotten very, very good at over all this time is learning to ignore everything that does not matter and separate the risks from idiots and learn to spot problems before they happen. The risks are varied from equipment failure to crew problems, people not showing up, participant problems, fight injuries, indirect injury, assholes. But the one thing that we can depend on at Burning Man is that by its nature, people know the risks. They are, know what they're getting themselves into and have bought into the experience. And this is dramatically different than operating anything like this anywhere else. This is an event where the ticket is printed with the large reassuring words, you voluntarily assume the risk of serious injury or death by attending. When we run the Thunderdome once a year back home in the Bay Area, we face the additional, not insignificant challenge of people who are not used to this sort of thing and who have not bought into the experience. They're not participants so much as attendees, and that brings a whole bunch of other problems, most of which have nothing to do with the environment and everything to do with the assumptions of the audience. Oh, there's the day since last century sign. Exploring off limits in the real world is a whole different thing. So for the last few years, I've been arranging the explorations for the society and leading them myself in the Bay Area. So, and along with visits to archives and libraries, I like to bring people into otherwise off limits places so they get the opportunity to see the city they think they know, but have only scratched the surface of. Getting regular people into those tunnels under Alcatraz or out to visit the ghost fleet or into abandoned military installations or into those abandoned train stations legally and without anyone getting hurt is a lot of work. All of these places are places that with a little bit of creativity and daring, you or I could get ourselves into. But it's a whole different bag of cats when you're in charge of a group, particularly when it's a group of random strangers. And the key to keeping the insanity to a minimum is planning. Once you have any idea in place, you don't need to start thinking about what you need and planning to mitigate the risk. The very first step is to ask. Don't be afraid to ask somebody else. Experience is the absolute most vital asset that you can possibly have when planning to do something stupid. If you don't have the experience, the very first thing I would do, or that I do, is to reach out to someone who has done something similar and get their advice. After that, these are the basic steps. Assess the risk honestly. 
What could possibly go wrong? Thinking about your worst case scenario allows you to back up from that and think about what you can do to avoid it and what to do if it does happen. Understanding the consequences. It's important to know both the realistic possible risks as well as the legal consequences before you do it. Decide on your level of responsibility. Is it feasible to pull permits and insurance? I often do for the things that I do, I'm able to. If you can afford to do so and it works for your event, by all means get them. They're a pain, but they're not nearly as much of a pain as a really expensive lawsuit or injury. And here, I think it's worth saying, any time you can accomplish your goal and keep it legal, do it. Crazy hijinks need not always be illegal. Know your crowd and plan accordingly. People are unpredictable individually, but very predictable in groups, particularly when you develop your ability to identify categories. Your people, party people, random strangers, douchebags. After experience, this is the second most important factor to consider. And perhaps it seems obvious, but whenever humanly possible, avoid doing all of this work for douchebags because they will mess everything up. <laughs> and then assemble your team. These are the people that I want at my side when I'm doing something exciting and dumb. First category that I always go to is backstage theater nerds. They know that the show has to go on and they can make do when things are going wrong. And then the second group that I immediately go to is bouncers because they know how to not escalate volatile situations. EMTs and other people with medical and emergency training are also great to have on hand, not so much for their specific expertise, but for the depth of experience that comes from working in emotionally fraught environments and calmly vetting the situation and finding an answer. Wherever possible, you want people who are problem solvers and who can independently determine the best course of action. And team leadership is tricky, but is always better than one point person. However, point people with specific expertise are always a good idea. And then finally, adjust expectations and set guidelines for your participants. The more people know what to expect, the more they're buying into the risk, the less problem you have with people getting into needless trouble. The best possible preparation is to make everyone feel like they're in this with you, and they're, rather than outsiders who expect to be entertained. At Thunderdome, we talk about something called the theater of chaos. And what we mean by that is, although what we do is actually inherently dangerous, it's a gently controlled kind of chaos. What people see is a show. What they don't see is months of planning, prep, and training. There are 30 assigned jobs every night, many of which require advanced training. In addition to on-stage roles, we have less glamorous but absolutely essential support roles that go largely unnoticed by participants, including security, vetting participants for being too drunk or too high, and a crew of EMTs in the dome at all time. In all, there's more than 60 crew members that make the show go. For events like our recent exploration at the condemned train station, I recruited five volunteers to come along to keep an eye on the crowd and to keep people off of dangerous collapsing stairwells. But people do get hurt. Uh, dome crew. Um, even people that should know better. Um, that's my glamorous eye patch from two years ago. And that's Rachel James, the editor in chief of Atlas Obscura, with her wrist brace on day two of the event. <laughs> Um, over the years in the desert, we've seen pretty much everything from bleeding head wounds to dislocated shoulders and broken arms. Once and once only, there was a ruptured testicle. At explorations closer to home, accidents happen as well. A friend recently spent some quality time in a cast after a speedy departure from an off-limits party went awry. Ultimately, if the risks are unacceptably high, don't do it, or do it just with friends. But don't be caught by surprise. Have a plan. All of this is not to say that you should not do risky and amazing things. Do them. But also know that sometimes the insane cage fights you saw that one time drunk at Burning Man is actually run by 65 people with a decade of experience and highly technical skills. Know that sometimes the rickety looking equipment is stage dressed to give a heightened sense of risk. And that those burly looking dudes on the sidelines may actually be EMTs. But why do these things if there's so much work? Because the goal can be to share extraordinary experiences or peeks into the hidden world with others. Others that might not want to climb a fence or try a locked door and who would otherwise not know that these things exist. Because if you have the ability to share these things, that's a gift that you should share with the world. Because the look on someone's face the first time they see Thunderdome is worth it. Because the community I know from Thunderdome are some of the best people I've ever met and had the privilege to do hard labor in the sun with. 
and because the inside of that train station is gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you, Aneta. And now, I don't have any visuals. Sorry. You can you can just leave that there. Do you want to hit the power button on the projector? It's on the remote that's in the case. One more time. Yay! Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Kochuk. Hi, everybody. I don't have any visuals, so it's just me. Um, Nathan asked me to talk about how do you get, and, and Ida, uh, how do you get people to, a large group of people, to do these sort of complicated large things? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I like to do large, complicated events. Um, I think they make people happy. Uh, they make people happy because they present novel challenges. And when you have a novel challenge that you do with a group, you wind up forming a bigger, more strong, healthier group. Um, so I think they're totally worth doing. But let's be clear, I have terrible luck. I carry around this piece of wood with me to knock on, seriously. Um, this is not a prop, this is something I carry. Um, because I have terrible luck, what I've found the antidote to that is, for me, is, or at least something to help me have better luck, is planning. Now, most people think planning, creative people, danger, danger! Things, creative people don't plan. That kills creativity. Rules kill creativity. Yes and no. I agree with that. Um, uh, there's this guy, he's sitting in the front row. His name's Chris Hackett. Uh, he runs the Madagascar Institute. He and I had this conversation every now and again, where he's like, you know, the problem is, is that there's people and they do stuff, and then there's these people who want to come and help, but they can't actually do stuff. Um, so instead of making things or making things happen, they make rules. They make things so that they create bureaucracy, so that the focus stops becoming the thing that you're doing, but it becomes actually the, uh, the implementation of those rules. Um, the rules aren't made, is that kind of a okay synopsis? Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> um, since you're here, I just thought I'd ask. Um, as I move on in my notes, sorry about that. Um, so I think though the problem isn't necessarily the rules, but it's the bureaucracy that they create, where it sort of takes the focus off the best, in, the best intent of the artist and goes to where the, they distract from the process. But if you, so, what does that mean? Anarchy everywhere, always. Yes and no. Um, let me posit two things. Dead mice and guidelines. Um, if you have heard my screed on uh, dead mice, feel free to tune out right now. Um, but dead mice, a lot of people talk about how managing creative people is like herding cats. Anybody not hear that? OK, great. So thank you. Um, so what's the problem with herding cats? This is the problem. If you have hired cats to be a herd, you have hired the wrong animal, that's your problem, <laughs> right? Um, so, but you've hired cats, you've got cats. What you need to do is not say, oh, I need you to follow these rules, but you need to find a barn. You need to find a barn full of mice and you need to be in the dead mouse business because all you need to do is point those cats, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all you need to do is point those cats to where those mice are and they will be dead. They will go and kill those mice. So instead of trying, so what does that mean? So instead of trying to tell people what to do, find out what they want to do, show them how to do it, show them where they should do it, and they will go and accomplish those things. So instead of telling people what to do, get them to be inspired to do things and then let them do it. That's how I think you need to lead creative people. Um, When I was doing work with the Madagascar Institute, um, 
some of the best projects that I think we ever worked on was one where somebody came up with a general theme and people got to fill in the blanks. So I like to call this model project, the Madagascar Institute presents the zoo. So one person would claim to be the zookeeper. Hey, okay, so we're going to be a zoo, I'm the zookeeper, I get to, you know, I'm sort of over in charge of the overall event. But you get to be whatever animal you want. So if you want to be a giraffe, you can giraffe however you want. If you want to be a, a crocodile, feel free. You want to be a dinosaur? Sure, why not? Go ahead. But basically, those projects were successful because somebody picked an overall theme. They created boundaries, but then let people go in and implement things the way they wanted to. So again, instead of telling people exactly what to do, showing them where the problems lie and letting them go in and solve them themselves. The reason, one of the reasons why Nathan asked me here is because I did a project called The Lost Rise of Night Market. Again, basically that model project put into practice. We're going to have a market. You can do whatever you want, but you want, but what everyone did was rented a box truck and put an installation in the back or some variation of that. And again, I think it's a successful way of getting creative people to do stuff. Um, guidelines. Okay, so talked about dead mice. Guidelines. Um, Nobody likes rules. Rules are frozen. Uh, the reasons why those rules came up, maybe you don't know why. Maybe you also don't understand like how those rules apply to extenuating circumstances. So does that mean we get rid of rules entirely? Maybe. What I posit is that maybe instead you have guidelines. What's the difference between a rule and a guideline? Um, a rule, frozen. A guideline, it's sort of saying, hey, this is what I think we should do. Here's why. Here's the cases that it would apply. It makes the rule more active. It makes it a negotiation. I think creative people actually prefer guidelines over rules because they understand where they came from and they understand how to change the guidelines to make it work for them. Um, if you want a really good example of guidelines, in my opinion, there's an artist by the name of Tom Sachs. He has a video called 10 Bullets and it's basically the rules of his studio. If you see that, he lays out not only what the rules are, but why those rules are there and how they apply and why they make working better. Um, if, it's a really great example of what, how guidelines work and rules become limiting. Uh, a few more odds and ends on how I think you can get creative people to do things. Poorly kept secrets are great. Um, what is a poorly kept secret? A poorly kept secret is saying, okay, hey, look, I don't want you to tell, this is between me and you, but you can tell a couple people. In our modern society, there's a lot of information. Almost anybody can get any information, but difficult information is really valuable. Difficult to get information is really valuable. Um, I'm not sure if I stuttered when I said that. That's why I said it twice. Um, and so, What's interesting about that is when people start sharing that information and you say, hey, don't blast it to everyone, just give it to the people that you think are interesting, then that person suddenly becomes holder of value. And in order to keep that value for themselves, but to share it, they sort of have to keep it secret. But they've also shared it, so it's become something that's really valuable. So poorly kept secrets. Um, I also think another interesting thing in terms of uh, doing events like this is to the point Annette made earlier. It doesn't have to be illegal to be fun. Uh, playing along the line is also a really interesting thing. You can walk up to the line. You can be doing things that are just um, interesting, weird, slightly off, that still feels like they're illegal, but still within, well within the bounds of the law. If uh, we got a chance, I can talk a little bit about how the night market does that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, and uh, now we're going to call up Myrick Lehner. Myrick is um, Myrick's our uh, resident medical expert. Um, he uh, is uh, one of the key collaborators on the 
recent speakeasy that we just built in a water tower, and uh, he does safety and security for all the Wanderlust events, and uh, does a lot of emergency and wilderness uh, kind of shenanigans, and he works for Doctors Without Borders. Uh, Mark is just going to give you a, he's not a doctor, but he's going to, he's going to give you some helpful advice for all of the rest of you who are also not doctors. Nor do I work for them as a doctor. <laughs> they would not accept that. Um, stop that. Okay, so you'd like to go explore things. Uh, maybe you want to take some friends. Maybe you'd like to set something up large or even much larger. Maybe there's going to be violence involved in what you're doing. Um, and you know you're gonna you're gonna assess your risk. You're gonna try to control for risk where you can. Um, but people are gonna get hurt. Um, a people are gonna get hurt, um, and you're gonna want to be prepared for that. A uh, couple things. First and foremost, I guess, as you're sort of exploring, maybe doing your preliminary work, uh, things that are gonna be, excuse me, uh, involved. Things, there's things that are not going to be in your med kit, things that should be a basic kit uh, for your explorations, such as flashlight, gloves, um, pocket knife or leather, pocket knife or leatherman, um, a dust mask. This is very serious. <laughs> Asbestos is no good. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so those, those are things that should be, you know, the base. And then... Um, if you're bringing yourself, you're bringing your friends in, uh, you might want to have a med kit. I like to carry a med kit. Uh, most of you aren't doctors. I'm not a doctor. And if you are a doctor, you're not going to be giving anyone uh, definitive medical care 40 feet underground. Uh, what you're going to be doing is trying to either bandage up whatever cuts, bruises, scrapes are going to show up. You're going to try to limit infections. And you're going to try to stabilize situations, if anything is bad, uh, until actual medical care arrives. So. There's just a couple basic options. Um, we're just trying to give you guys some hints and suggestions. Um, uh, you can build your own med kit very easily with bandages and splints and uh, so forth from the pharmacy. Um, there's also a number of pre-made kits that I like because they just happen to be uh, pretty compact and rugged. Uh, some of them are even waterproof. Uh, I go to either REI, EMS, um, from adventure medical kits, there's sets that go from you know 15 to 190 bucks for professionals. Um, if you're in a small group, this might be a good move. If you have uh, you know a little bit of medical training, if you are actually running something like a net over here, you should probably find real EMTs. Um, uh, and then when you get the sort of this kind of thing, um, you'll want to hack it a little bit. Uh, rubber gloves often aren't included. Added a couple of those. Uh, extra band-aids. And um, if you're like me, I'm wearing contacts. Uh, I see well without them, about an inch away from my eyes and no further. Uh, my worst nightmare is to be exploring something, you know, miles, miles from help in a, you know, crumbling building and suddenly I can't see. Uh, so I always you know, could think of that and add in my contact solution and so forth. Um, and then secondly, I guess, you know, consider where you're going. Are you, are you doing something right around here in New York? Are you going to be traveling further? Sometimes there's amazing buildings that are, you know, miles down the road, hidden on a mountaintop somewhere. Uh, and so keep that in mind if you're putting a kit together and you want, like, moleskin, you want some splints. Um, yeah, keep those. Um, and then lastly, uh, real fast, uh, for actual medical training in New York, uh, you have a couple options with basic first aid from the Red Cross. Uh, you have the New York, uh, New York Health Department has a site that shows you all the different places that are certified to offer EMT courses. And then uh, my personal favorite coming from a you know, mountaineering and trip leading background is wilderness first aid, wilderness first responders uh, from the Wilderness Medical Association, the Wilderness Medical Institute with Knowles, uh, Solo up in Maine, and uh, the AMC branch in for New York uh, offers their own like wilderness medical um, uh, or wilderness first aid courses. So, be safe. Don't bleed. Awesome. Thanks, Merrick. <laughs>
we'll, we'll have links. We'll have links to everything he mentioned uh, up on the site. And uh, now I think we got a few questions for Mark and Anetta. Um, I'd be interested to hear um, a risk you've taken that you're never going to take again, and why. You go first. You go. Uh, a risk I've taken that I'll never take again. Sure. Um, so one of the times uh, we did a night market that was in a large warehouse. Um, and so the first one we did, we did out on the street. And it turned out great. Um, the next one was in February. And uh, the, my co-producer for the night market and I, his name's Kevin Baltic, um, we were like, wow, it's going to be cold. We should do it inside. Um, the night market, for those of you who might not know it, as I mentioned before, I get people to rent box trucks and do installations inside. Um, it's, so we had a, about a dozen, 16 trucks come into uh, this very large, high-ceilinged warehouse. Um, everything was great. Uh, and then the generators came on. Um, because we had everyone bring their own power. Um, generators, in, gasoline burning generators inside a warehouse was the stupidest thing I think I could have let happen. <laughs> um, Jeff Stark, who's sitting right there, thank you very much. I don't know if I've ever thanked you publicly for rearranging all of the power so that people didn't die. Um, it was a risk, it was a calculated risk. We didn't think it was gonna be a problem, luckily, um, as Annetta alluded to earlier, you know, it's great when you have a crew that is capable and can help. Uh, and, you know, New York City has a lot of very capable people who are very supportive uh, when you're doing these things. So, um, again, thank you, Jeff, for helping with that. And then the thing about it is, is, you know, there was a problem. It got dealt with. Uh, people raised an alarm, and that was great. So, a so what was the risk? Um, doing something in an environment that I wasn't exactly sure of. Um, the mitigation is, hmm, guess I'm gonna do that again. Um, but also the other thing that was, that one of the reasons why it's great to do the night market out on the street is, um, you know, it lets everybody be responsible for themselves. And that was another thing that I learned from that is letting people be responsible as much as possible for exactly what they're doing makes everything easier for everyone. I don't think there's anything that I've done for the Obscura Society that I wouldn't do again. I think all of those are, are pretty carefully planned out because I know there's going to be random strangers. Um, but out in the desert, I stopped climbing to the very top of our dome a lot of years ago. Um, it's about a 25-foot fall from the dome, and about seven years ago, one of our crew fell. And uh, I saw that fall, and we all thought he was dead. Um, luckily, the wind was just knocked out of him, and our EMT was about 10 feet away and came up and uh, bruised ribs and all that, and he was fine. But um, we now use harnesses and climbing gear when we're setting up the top of the dome, and I realize my limits, and so I'm not part of that team anymore, even though at one time I, I didn't think it was such a big deal, but now I do. Thanks. Um, uh, my first question is, um, you, so you're, you're doing awesome things, and people want to join in and help. This is this will you know this happens really quickly. So how do you separate uh, the people who just want to crew um, and the people who just want to be there, accompany you for fun, um, from the people who are actually competent? Because the people who are just looking for fun are often very enthusiastic and really want to help out. How do you determine? you know, who actually can get stuff done and who's just there for the joyride. Um, in Thunderdome, we have a sponsorship process, like a, like a club. You have to be sponsored by a member um, and, and prove your worth. Um, for the society, we have something called field agents, and they're pretty much the process um, that you were talking about of, of a poorly kept secret. <laughs> Um, no one is, there's not broadly broadcasted or asked for, but people are that start helping out are asked to help other people. And then we've had people who have volunteered who seem sort of are that category that you're talking about. Um, and we just kind of don't aggressively extend the invitation to them. And people self-select. The ones that, that really um, push for it have, in my experience, proven themselves to be, to be worthwhile members of the team. 
Um, I'm going to parrot uh, self-selection is really interesting. Um, oftentimes the people who want to come just for fun, when you're like, great, well that means you're going to have to carry an upright base up eight flights of stairs <laughs> to get there. Is that okay? And you're not going to be able to pee. Eight's not that many. <laughs> we, we recently did 35 flights of stairs with a double base. Sure, but you're, just for the winnowing out part, you know, you start with the eight flights and then you move up to 35 because I think a lot of people would be winnowed out by 35. Um, but yeah, I think there's something to be said for self-selection. If somebody's like, oh yeah, I'm willing to do that, then, you know, maybe they're there more than just fun or maybe they're going to prove themselves out a little bit more. Um, and also... Things like the night market, it's okay to take a little bit of a risk. It's sort of, yeah, well, let's 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 try it out. You know, it's um, like I said, the night market is designed to let people be independent. So it's sort of like, uh, sure, we'll invite you along. Let's just give it a try and, and see how it happens. Um, uh, so I, th I think this the the model of the night market is really interesting because you're asking people to be responsible for themselves, which is kind of the opposite of most wanderlust events. Um, we we call people who come to our events guests um, because we consider ourselves responsible for them. We call most of the crew stewards. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're kind of going to extremes to make sure that all types of people can participate and that they need to be basic situationally aware but are not actually taking care of themselves. So so I wonder, um, you know, how do you, how do you decide how much responsibility you're taking on as people who are designing events, um, people who are um, asking people to take risks that maybe they can't assess themselves, um, and how do you ask other people to, who you are inviting to take those risks on themselves? Like, what, where, where's the line there? Okay, well, you and I have talked about, uh, you know, your events, and then there's other events besides the night market that I do where there are things that uh, we, where I've been involved in taking people into things where it's not, totally your responsibility. Hey, this is this is all on you. We've designed it. Um, and I think, you know, that there is some amount of, like, talking to the people, figuring out who they are, uh, figuring out how much you can risk them. But And I've been to your event as a guest. Um, and I would say the, the idea that the line is, is where it's almost where you want to put it. You know, it's like, how, what are the risks? You know, are, are they going to get hurt? Are they going to stray far away? Are they going to give things away so that other people can't, can no longer participate? And I think if you, you just have to come up with a threshold of risk, what is it that could happen? What are the worst possible things that could happen? What are the ways to mitigate those things when they do happen? Um, and that could be, you know, oh, well, we do need to select this person a little bit tighter. Uh, we do need to set up boundaries and margins for people. Um, we do need to do some basic uh, education to people before we bring them into the situation. Uh, you being on in one of your events, you know, before you took people up a flight of stairs, you laid out some basic ground rules. Don't step on this sort of step. Uh, keep your flashlight down. Um, I think you know those things are sort of, and then you know, sort of in the moment, you've got to decide, you know, what is worth doing and what is not worth doing. You know, the weather conditions have changed. The, it wasn't uh, this bright when we, scout, when we scouted it earlier. Suddenly there's security on premise. Right. Um, and then thinking those, trying to anticipate those things, coming up with a, a way to mitigate them, and just knowing when you're going to say enough is enough. I think personally, I would always prefer to have participants over attendees. If that was possible, I would always do it that way because the risks are just so much smaller when people know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, that's not always possible for, for a lot of kinds of things, but I think then what it's about is um, adjusting expectations and making sure that people, even if they don't know the exact experience that they're signing on for, they understand that they need to be wearing boots, so they understand that they need to bring a, a headlamp. Um, or that it's going to be cold and they should pack layers and, and all of those kind of things. So the people have an understanding of the environmental situation they're going to be in, if, even if they don't understand exactly what the adventure for the evening. Um, because that way you're getting them to buy in, not in a um, uh, fully informed participant way, but at least they
they they know that they're doing something and they're taking they're taking some risk before they ever show up to the event. So, I, but I turn that question around to you. I mean, how how do you guys handle that? Um, I mean, we we go to. We go to extreme measures to, to scout um, and check out all the locations we're going to. Um, we do a lot of the stuff that, that Annetta just pointed out. You know, people have to come in the right footwear. They have to um, make it clear that they understand that they are indeed trespassing, that they are indeed breaking the law. Those kinds of that those kinds of risks are made clear to a, a potential guest ahead of time. So if they show up, we've made sure they've jumped through a variety of hoops to get there. Um, but once they're there. Um, we go through extreme measures to make sure that they, like, you know, that their safety is taken care of. Um, they're not going to fall through a hole in the floor. They're not going to do something stupid and get the group arrested. Um, What's an extreme measure? Um, what is an extreme measure? I mean, when we did the illicit couples retreat, I think we went through all the rooms. Um, this was at an abandoned honeymoon resort in the Poconos. We went through um, all the rooms twice um, and made sure the rooms we selected that we brought people into. Um, were completely secure. There, were, there wasn't going to be any structural issues, and they had a steward with them the entire time they were wandering around the property, except for when they were in the, alone in the room with their guest, with their date. Um, the the place where this backfires is that we found that guests trust us so much that they forget the risk involved. Yeah. And so, so we're like, what, like, how do we let them lose themselves enough so that they are transported by the experience? But not so much that they remain situationally aware. We we tend to go towards the extreme of the guests losing themselves too much, and we've been amazed by how powerful the magic circle is there with people going to beautiful and amazing places, but us having to yeah really take care of folks. People are not situationally aware in general. Um, it's amazing how aggressively we had to keep people off of a obviously collapsing staircase at that train station. People will just do it. They just because you've given them permission to be on the property, they think that everything is fine and it's crumbling. Um, I've got a question for you. Uh, I recently had an experience where um, I was in the middle of doing something that I shouldn't have been doing, um, and uh, I suddenly realized that I wasn't really actually prepared to accept the consequences for the risk I had just taken. It was broad daylight and I was descending off of the top of the Brooklyn Bridge, walking yeah. down the cable, yeah. and I had a guitar on my back and Ida was carrying a camera and and it was broad daylight and I looked down on the street below and there's a team of men in orange vests paving the street and they're pointing up <laughs> and on their cell phones and I realized at this moment that I, it was it was a lot of fun to do what I had just done, but it wasn't it just wasn't worth it in that for that particular thing. I thought, oh, it would have been much better if I I could have done something that would have been worth it. But I'm going to be arrested, and uh, and just for for just just for goofing off and being stupid and climbing a bridge in the middle of the day. Um, so the the question is, how do you? Uh, prepare yourself, or how do you choose which legal risks you're prepared to accept, and how do you train yourself or like educate yourself about which legal risk you're prepared to accept without actually going and being like, well, I guess I'm going to try it and see what happens. How expensive is the ticket? I think I'd start there. <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, I'm risk averse. Uh, so I don't know if I would actually be climbing the Brooklyn Bridge in the middle of the day. Like I think I, I, I'm I'm a bit. Uh, did you hear my voice waver right there? Like yeah, I'm a little nervous about things like that. And so I would say you know that's an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But you know there is that moment where you're like. Uh, so there's that no trespassing sign, and I'm about to walk through that door anyhow, and I don't know what's behind it, or I've trusted somebody who said they've scouted out the place, and I'm about to walk through that door. Um, and I think life is about living. You know, life is about, um, you know, taking some risks. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's very American to take risks. It's very American to be, you know, the cowboy and to, and to try to, to do these things. So, I mean, you could look at it, I'm sure someone could argue both sides of the, uh, the debate as, you know, is doing this a patriotic act, you know? 
pushing the boundaries. Um, so, yeah. Um, is Moses Gates in the house? No? Uh, so recently, one of the great talks that we had in the Bay Area was John Law and Moses Gates came, and they both presented specifically on their shenanigans of climbing high places. Both of them have climbed all kinds of tall places that I would be terrified to go um, and have amazing evidence of it. Um, but Moses shared his story of climbing to the top of the Great Pyramids of Giza, um, which strikes me as an exception to the, uh, the risk thing because it's absolutely worth it, and I think he's ruined it for all of us. Um, but um, I think you have, to, you have to look at what the consequences are, whether it's a danger of slipping and falling and hurting yourself terribly, um, or which um, John actually shared a terrifying story where he was um, almost killed by a, a sudden moving part while he was on a bridge and didn't understand the mechanics of it. Uh, so there's very real dangers in climbing or exploring in places where you don't understand the infrastructure. And so there's that, um, and realizing that unless you're an expert on those places that you probably don't know all of the things about them. And then um, exactly how much that fine is and whether you've decided that it's worth it to, in your bucket list to pay that, whatever that crazy fine is. Um, it, I think this story is interesting because it also brings up what you said about um, doing these things in groups and group leadership and the, the strength that comes from that, but also the, the difficulties in the moment of, of working together. And so when we were up on, on the Brooklyn Bridge, I was like, sun's coming up. We got to get our asses down. And, and so we had this moment of debate on the top of the bridge of like, what's the risk we're gonna take? And, and it seems like for, for teams, you kind of have to put yourselves in those situations of risk over and over again because people don't behave the way you think they're gonna behave. And the only way you can manage that communication is, is by being there. And so that kind of risk we took together, we didn't put anybody else in that position of risk and we're probably not gonna be, no, we're definitely not gonna be putting anybody else <laughs> in that position. So when, when we're scouting stuff, you know, we scout it over 10 times. So we work out these situations of risk and how we're gonna lead in that situation so that we're not having those kinds of disagreements in the moment. Um, and so in that sense, just put it, putting yourself on the edge like that over and over again with the people you're gonna be doing it with um, is, is hugely valuable and I, don't, I, I still can't believe we do what we do over and over again, given, given the disagreements we get into. Um, uh, so this is gonna be on the internet, but how did that story resolve itself? They sent two helicopters. One of them flew underneath the bridge, which I've never seen before. I think they were just looking for a good excuse to fly underneath the bridge. Helicopters are not supposed to be doing stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and I felt very chastened. I, I thought that like your tax dollars are, uh, I mean, probably you, most of you don't pay taxes, but your tax dollars <laughs> were paying for that helicopter. Uh, and and uh, I, I felt bad. I, I, didn't, I thought I had done something fairly foolish and wasted things that weren't worth wasting. There's probably a good time to waste those. There's, there's probably a good patriotic moment to waste those resources. I, I just wanted to film a, a cheesy video on top of the Brooklyn Bridge, and it was kind of a stupid stunt. And um, it, it was a beautiful place to be. I highly recommend climbing the Brooklyn Bridge. But don't... Do it at night. Go down at night. Yeah. Or alternately, is there any way you can do that legitimately? Yes. Can you talk your way into that situation? Then yeah, maybe no, there are legitimate ways to go up Social engineering might be the solution to those kinds of things. Yeah. Are we ready to open it up? Yeah, Okay. Question. Here, I'll just, I'll just repeat that. Uh, have you ever gone into places that um, are, you know, you might have been able to sneak into and you might have been trespassing, but instead you got permits? And how do you do that? Yeah, how do you absolutely. Get permission? Um, for the Obscure Society, um, we've done several things like that. Um, most off the top of my head, um, we've worked with the national parks to get us unusual access at Alcatraz. Um, we worked with Eastern State Penn to get into their off limit spaces and the, um, the 16th Street Station in Oakland was the, uh, the station that I showed at the end of my presentation. Um, they're all different, and I find that the general rule is that I have to email and call 10 people to get one to call me back. 
and um, that I have to pursue them relentlessly. And they often don't understand why the kind of people that I'm representing, the kind of people that I'm trying to haul along, want to go to these places. It's, it's volunteers and uh, park rangers. And in the case of the 16th Street Station, it's a property management company that's been sitting on this property for a decade. Um, and to them, it's a pain in the ass. It's a $30 million restoration project that they can't afford. Um, and it's definitely boarded up and it's illegal and it's got um, a big chain link hurricane fence around it. What I did is I emailed the property company and I emailed them again and then I friended them on Facebook and then I messaged them on Facebook and then I emailed them again and then I found a phone number and I called them and then I happened to run into somebody that represented the property group at um, another meeting and I introduced myself and told them what I wanted to do and I emailed them again and it was about a year. I had completely forgotten about it and basically given up on it. Um, and uh, I got an email out of the blue saying, hey, I, found, I saw this email that you sent eight months ago, and um, we'd love to have your group by. <laughs> Absolutely, come by. And um, what we did is we, we had waivers. Um, it didn't cost, it cost us, um, uh, which is what I, what I try and negotiate for us all the time because we don't have deep pockets, is I negotiate a price per head so that it's only relative, I don't have a risk, financial risk, unless it's for people that have paid for tickets. And then we had them sign a waiver, and we talked about hard hats and decided hard hats were not needed as long as I brought in. There's no electricity and no water. I brought um, a medical kit. I always have a field bag with me that has the basics. Um, and I brought that team of volunteers that were there to babysit the stairs. And um, we also brought in um, battery-powered lighting so that we could light the dark corners. And we stood there and watched everyone, and we went in in small groups. Um, and the property management company, I think it's fair to say, loved it. And they're repeating the experience now with other people other than our group because it went so well. Um, and as a result, what we did is a photo day. And so we, we invited people to come in, and people brought in, one, one group brought in this large format camera that uses x-ray film. It's like this big, set up long exposures, and took absolutely magnificent photographs in this space that's normally off limits. And then we held a salon evening a week later where we presented the photographs that everyone had taken. And so a larger audience than were able to get tickets to that, that one small event were able to see the photographs and understand that this is a piece of our cultural heritage that is sitting there slowly being eaten away by time. And that the next time a bond measure comes up, the next time they're trying to raise money to save a building like that, hopefully those people will be more invested in seeing that it's saved. I mean, in a in a minor way, we gave them a cut of our ticket sales. I think it added up to fifteen hundred bucks. And did they want to see a specific sort of like corporation of your organization? Like no, they never asked for that. They they asked us. They I mean, I had to vouch that everyone was going to be well behaved, and I had to provide the names on the tickets and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, no. Another question. Are the events that uh, that you all have done uh, typically monetized to cover your expenses, and uh, if not, uh, how do you figure out how to divide and shoulder that financial burden? And if so, how do you figure out how to? Uh, Great question. Do you charge for your events, and what happens when you don't charge for them, and how do you divide the stuff? Costs money. How do you divide that? What do you do? Um, I'll say for me really quickly, the answer is yes and no. Um, Alcatraz is a national park. It wouldn't allow us to charge anything, so we didn't charge anything. Um, and in a sort of net gain way, it cost us because we did all the publicity and we took photographs and we guided the people and we didn't make anything in that, but it was worth it to us for the opportunity for our extended community, so we did it that way. Um, most of our obscure society makes nominal money. For Thunderdome, we hold fundraisers and raise all the money ourselves. Um, and, it, and then we also have membership dues. Um, I don't charge for my events. Um, I usually work with collaborators to have everyone sort of you know, pitch in what they can. Uh, I sometimes cover like base costs for stuff. But um, I don't think of it as free. Um, for the Lost Horizon Night Market, everyone's encouraged to ask for donations who's doing a truck, and everyone's encouraged to give something. Um, but that something could be a handshake, that something could be you know, a few dollars, it could be a bag of fireworks. Um, but everyone's encouraged to donate something. Um, 
But the other thing that I like to think about is um, it's creating culture, um, and culture is worth investing in. I feel like you can look at life where everyone has two bank accounts or two kinds of bank accounts, one denominated in dollars, another one denominated in dinners, um, meaning how many people would buy you a dinner if you were down on your luck. Um, I feel like the what I put into any of these cultural projects, I get back in dinners. Um, for water lust events, we, we never charge. Um, part of that has to do with the kind of risk um, that people are taking. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that we consider all of our events um, and projects gifts. Um, and so we want people to be in a position where they're um, receiving. Um, and so usually that doesn't mean a ticket kind of system. Um, the way we handle costs is um, sometimes we might get a small grant. Sometimes we have somebody um, donate money for a future event who's been at a past event and really had a great time. Um, and the rest of the costs we just eat. Um, and, and so far, the, the expenditure in terms of covering the cost for the events has filled my bank account of dinners I can get far, far beyond any dinners I could buy myself. Um, and, and the value of that has been amazing. And I consider it a small fraction of hopefully what we're actually putting out into the world in terms of culture. Um, and that's hugely rewarding and definitely worth the effort. I think there was a question over here. Um, the question was um, if the permits can't be secured, um, if um, folks go in and still attempt to do something in the space and take on that risk. No, I don't. Um, not when I'm bringing other people. I've been known to climb fences and go into tunnels and rooftops myself and with other like-minded willing participants, but I'm not going to take anyone into that situation. Uh, I try to design stuff so I don't need permits. I try to go places where, you know, Things are happening on the street and there's things that you can do like people don't like it when you gather in the middle of the street people like it when you keep on moving on sidewalks so i try to design things so that i'm not um needing permits to to do what i do uh or to do the things that i'm interested in um there's um yeah and it's also you know if there was something that i wanted to get a permit for going in and doing it anyhow is sort of asking for trouble in the future when you do want to get that permit later. Um, and it's about building good relationships with people. So if you're just going to take the thing anyhow, um, it might not be the best risk, especially if you kind of might want to get that permit later. Another question. So I very actively try not to be political in any sort of way. Um, I think that there's probably some implicit politics. Um, but And then in terms of uh, dealing with things that are, you know, any legal implications, I try not to do anything that's really illegal. Um, police do really important work. Um, I am really glad on a daily basis I do not have to do my own police work. Um, there, it's great to have a vendor for policing. Um, and so I do things so that, you know, if it gets inspected by the police, they will laugh and maybe have a good story later and then get on with their very important busy day that are actually, you know, doing work that I respect. Yeah, I think I pretty much have the same thing to say. In the desert, we cultivate a relationship with law enforcement. Um, we, uh, I think a lot of participants out there think of us as the jerks of the desert, but we are buddies with the cops. Um, they, they know us, they're familiar with our hijinks. In the real world, the kind of events that I do, I, I try and the same thing. I try to make sure that we're um, going by the guidelines. I make sure that we don't need a tour operator permit in the Bay Area. Um, and the only encounters I've had, I've had the same kind of experience where they come up and they ask a couple of nosy questions. Um, at the Enchanted Rebar Forest, we ran into some police officers um, because there's a, a homeless population out there and they're basically just sort of doing their round and we're wondering why a bunch of non-hobos were out there. And they asked a couple of questions and we told them what we were doing and they're like, okay, and they went off and did their thing. 
And I think I would just say. Yeah, I want to hear your answer to that. <laughs> well, I think I would just say that if you're going to be doing anything that has, uh, if you're going to be doing anything that you know that the law is really going to care about, then probably you shouldn't be doing it in any circumstance having anything to do with anything we're talking about tonight. So, um, if if you want to, you know, if, if you want to hold, uh, you know, an LSD shroom convention, like do it somewhere where nobody's going to care about what you're doing. You know, don't do it with a big group of people skydiving on to the roof of the World Trade Center wearing Allahu Akbar t-shirts. <laughs> Next question. What did you do for bathroom with my hair? Next question. <laughs> Uh, could you be more specific about this stuff? I'm, uh, the first event you guys organized, what was the inspiration? What's the, what's the first thing you ever did that, let's say, was, you know, uh, out of the ordinary? Um, well, I grew up climbing around in the tunnels at the uh, Marin Headlands, um, and I just thought it was normal teenage activity, so it's this sort of an extension on stuff that I always did. But my, the first thing I did with um, Obscure Society is we did Obscure Day, um, which was, it's like a hundred events all on one day. We did it three years in a row. Um, what I do now is ten times easier than that. <laughs> so just kind of jumped in with both feet. Um, yeah, much very similar story. I've just always done stuff like this, uh, where I remember throwing picnics in the middle of traffic islands with friends in high school or um, staging like people going crashing fountains in malls because that where I grew up there wasn't a lot to do um, and then uh, doing sort of um, you know I, I was very lucky I got turned on to a group called the Madagascar Institute um, through somebody who I worked with and um, I got pulled into doing all sorts of interesting fun events uh, and it was great to do it with other people, and then it turned into something like, huh, I kind of want to try running one myself, and being involved with a bunch of really uh, great people who were like, sure, go ahead and try. Um, and uh, who, yeah, who let me go ahead and try and fail or succeed, and either way it was okay. Um, uh, I think similarly to Mark, just growing up, I was always hanging out with folks who were doing this stuff, so. Um, as, as a teenager in high school in New York, I just kind of fell in with some of the awesome squatter community on the Lower East Side and spent a lot of my free time like hanging out in the big beautiful squats that are no longer down there and got really accustomed to being in those spaces and um, you know treating, treating them as spaces of safety rather than spaces of risk. Um, and, and I continue to be drawn to those spaces. And um, I think the first time that I actually wanted to orchestrate bringing people along was when I first teamed up with Nathan and um, it was a matter of stumbling upon a place, like literally stumbling upon it, um, and being so inspired by it that we wanted to share it with people. I think the first thing I ever did that that really made a difference uh, to me, or that I that I thought, oh, I'm actually doing something, was um, when I uh, saw I saw a billboard, and it, um, it had a, a, a beer bottle on one side, and it had a woman's crotch on the other side, and it said, "Expect everything," and I. <laughs> I remember thinking, this isn't the world that I want to live in. Um, and so I uh, got a couple of my friends and we got together in the middle of the night and we climbed up on the billboard and we painted over everything and we'd made a stencil that beautifully matched the font and uh, when we were done it said, expect misogyny. And uh, I thought, right, this thing didn't pass the sister test. Um, this is the world. This is the world that I want to live in, and I'm and I'm and I can make that world. I could, this this can this can be. This is something that is doable. And then the cool thing about that was the next day someone else climbed up on the billboard and painted uh, some rape statistics on there. And someone else climbed up the next board and painted over our thing and just totally totally erased it. I thought, oh well, it didn't last. Right. Next day someone else climbed up there and painted over a totally different thing that was also that also was like this is a shitty billboard. <laughs> um, it's funny because I was actually just going to give a quick shout out. I also grew up um, in the land of the Cacophony Society, 
Um, and so I remember seeing the billboard, which is what I was just going to say, that had the picture of Amelia Earhart, the Apple ad that I think originally said think different and it got changed to think doomed. I think it's actually in there. And it was by the side of the freeway on a very, very exposed place where people would have to go and, um, and modify it at great risk to themselves in order to make that quirky little thing. And I remember just thinking, damn, that's amazing. And I grew up hearing about all kinds of shenanigans, and um, I'm now privileged to get to actually do them. You should come to our talk next Tuesday. Where we will have lawyers up here who will tell you all about that, and they're really great. They're really great. Don't take legal advice from us. Yeah, don't take legal advice from us. Absolutely not. Next question. One more question, maybe? No, wait. You already asked one. Someone else. How would you solicit volunteer help when you don't have rent? So how would you get someone to walk five flights of stairs on a base when you don't have thunder? How do you solicit people to help you with your crazy and really stupid things? I promised him booze. Um, have good friends and just, you know, make good relationships and then, you know, make it seem like it's going to be better than staying home and watching TV. Uh, that's really one of the, like, when someone asks me, well, why did you do that? How did you do that? Because uh, I don't really like staying home and watching TV. Um, and I've got to tell you, once you get a couple friends doing something that kind of blows their mind a little bit, they'll want to do it again, and they'll want to do it again, and then they'll want to do it even more. The Wanderlust model tends to be that we have crew and we have guests, and the guests get one kind of experience, like we make something for them. But the crew, we try to make something for the crew that is also an experience that's so interesting on its own that they're doing work, sometimes really hard work, um, but the work is an adventure. I think the other part um, that I would say is volunteering for other people's projects, carrying their base up 35 floors is a good way to end up getting those people when you need to do it. And um, the community that I have through Thunderdome is absolutely present in all of the obscure society stuff that I do. It's the poorly kept secret, usually. It's the thing where I can't really tell you about it, but I'm gonna tell you anyhow. Um, the thing in Fight Club, where they're like, you do not talk about Fight Club, um, actually really does work very well um, to, to find guests. Oftentimes, um, you know, I know some people who do events where people will write in, and uh, they'll be like, wow, I really wanna be part of it, and writing a really great letter may or may not help, but it does, It probably doesn't hurt um, to people that you want to do this with. Or, um, you know, the other thing is success breeds success. So a great way to become a guest is to be doing stuff that's really cool and people find out about it and they're like, I want to bring you to my thing. Um, or I, I, I'm doing this thing, you'd like to do this thing, you know, let's, let's do something together. Um, so I would say, you know, a great way to be a guest is to be a host. Um, we, we definitely don't care for spectators. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to be doing the awesomest thing ever, um, but it has to be clear that you want to be a participant um, and that we can collaborate with you um, and develop a relationship with you even if it's just to give a gift because um, that requires a relationship. Um, and the ways that we form that vary based on the event or the opportunity or the gift. Um, and, and creating that and figuring out what that is in each circumstance is a huge part of the creative work that we do. Um, that's hugely rewarding. Thanks. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, we'd like to call up Dylan Thuris. Dylan, are you in the house? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Dylan Thuris. Hi. Uh, I'm Dylan Thuris. Uh, I'm the co-founder uh, of Alice Obscura, which is a website about hidden wonders and curiosities around the world and partners in crime with Aneta here. Uh, I want to just say two quick things. One, I want to tell the story of how you introduced me 
to what you do. Uh, and then I want to talk about this. A lot of this night has been talking about risk management. And I want to talk about one other part of this, which is uh, getting yourselves into situations where you have to start doing risk management. Because uh, I think um, it's, worth, it's worth saying, uh, from my perspective, well, I'll start with the story of how you introduced what you did to me, uh, which is <laughs> you told me, I didn't know what you guys did at all. I'd worked with you a little bit. And you told me to show up uh, on a corner in the Lower East Side at I don't know, 9 o'clock. Um, and I went there not knowing what I was getting myself into. And, but I felt kind of like, I, you know, I know what I'm getting myself into. Um, and then you guys proceeded to take me into this building, up onto this roof, onto another roof, down through some, uh, down a ladder, through some stairs, into this incredible space. And then when we got there, we all sat down and watched this performance. Uh, there was a music, there was a bass player, uh, and there was an aerial performer. And this was not the event. This was the event at which they asked us to participate in the actual event. And they could have asked me to uh, take a rocket ship to the moon at that point. I was uh, fully in. And, and so I, one for me, uh, everyone here, one difference, I think, between me and everyone on this stage is that uh, I am not particularly brave. Uh, I went exploring with um, Nathan and Todd, who's somewhere in here. And it was an, it was an incredible time. And it was this beautiful space. And when we emerged, they may have heard me scream, oh, thank God, <laughs> uh, for not getting caught or killed somehow. Um, and so for me, part of, part of doing what I do and working with, uh, with everyone um, here, with the exception of Mark, but I hope to fix that, um, is, is getting yourself into positions where you say, oh, yeah, we could do that. And then once there's enough people saying, oh, yeah, we could do that, then you have to start assessing the risks of what's involved. But I think that first step is, is just sort of taking the leap to say, like, sure, that seems possible. Uh, and so I just want to thank um, Nathan and Ida for being in residency at Alice Obscura, for helping organize these incredible talks, uh, and um, for both Aneta and Mark for, for your wisdom and brilliance. Um, so, and thank you all so much for coming. And there are going to be three more of these talks that deal with the design. Thank the you so much, Dylan. I would like my flashlight back. You're never getting it. It's oh. never happening. <laughs> I actually have one last really quick piece of advice, which is uh, Dylan brings up here. Um, I learned this from Mark Krawchuk and Kevin Baltic, which is if you're doing something and you're asking people to help you do it, and you have to like have a meeting to talk about the thing that you're doing because you probably have to do this because you want to be somewhat organized and you have to get people together for some meeting. Make your meeting be as interesting as the thing that you're doing. This is what Dylan's talking about where we, we did this event that we never repeated and didn't even publicize or, or talk about. It's not, you can't find it on our website. And we did that event just for the people who we wanted to help us make the actual event. And that event involved all kinds of trespassing and performers and, and beautiful, it was beautiful. We schlepped a cello in there. It was really amazing. And like after that, you know, Dylan was ready to go anywhere. Oh, yeah. So if you have to just like, and it was just a meeting where we just talked with people about what we needed to do. Make your meetings be that interesting. Uh, you know, make, make your meeting be a journey on its own and people will be totally ready to take a much bigger journey with you. Uh, I still know I'm doing something right when you start to get scared. <laughs> it's true. Um, well, thank you, everyone, so much for being here. Um, uh, next week, um, I think it's been mentioned already, but the, the talk is um, go directly to jail, trespassing in the law. And we have people who you should be taking legal advice from. So definitely come and, and learn from them. We're excited to see you. Um, check out the Wanderlust website for a link to get tickets. Same time, same place next week. See you there. Thank you.